Our scripture reading is from Hebrews 5, 1 through 11. And as we sing a psalm like Psalm 38, we certainly think, as in all the psalms, of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who came here to represent us in our sin. And that's the reason that he went to the cross. And he is the one who leads us in crying out to God in times of affliction when we have been humbled because of our sins. And so it is that we look to him as we call on the name of the Lord. We, we come in the name of Jesus Christ in all of our prayers and in all of our cries, giving thanks that our Lord Jesus is the one who has overcome for us and that in him we have hope because he is our priest and he is also our offering for sin. And so please listen now as I read to you from Hebrews chapter 5. We read the first 11 verses and here we're told of how he was made a priest for us and how in his priesthood that he was faithful and that he was heard because of his faithfulness. This is the word of God, Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant in going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. But it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. And there will end the reading of God's word. You see how it says that he was, has, has been perfected and therefore he became the author of salvation. The idea of Christ being perfected means that he became all that we needed in order to have atonement for our sin. And so we rejoice as we come before God, even in time of affliction, that our Lord Jesus has been afflicted and that in his affliction that he has made atonement for us so that we can come to God with confidence that, that we will be heard. Now I ask you to please turn to the prophet Joel. It follows Hosea in your Bible. So of course the minor prophets that come after Daniel in, in the scriptures and just before the New Testament, the 12 uh, books that come just before the New Testament. And the prophet Joel is right after the, the first of those 12 books, right after Hosea. I chose this book because Joel is in a situation, and the people of his day are in a situation that is very similar to the situation that we are in today. Jo the people in Joel's day were dealing with afflic an affliction that came completely out of the blue. It came as a surprise to them. There was no forewarning that there is, uh, this, this thing was going to come upon them. It came upon them very quickly. Joel 1, 1 through 4 tells us what happened to the people. I want to tell you I'm going to read through almost the entire book of Joel today, but uh, we'll read through it bit by bit and look in, at, at how it uh, relates to us. So let's see then in Joel 1, 1 through 4. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel 
the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. And there we'll pause our reading. Now you you think about this, these uh, locusts that are mentioned. I'm told that there are multiple words that were used at this time to describe different kinds of locusts because this was a time when they did have sometimes a plague that would come about because of locusts or a devastation that would come about. It was a time of the one of the ways that this is related to our times is when Joel wrote this, it was a time of relative prosperity for the people of God. This was probably written when King Joash was a boy king. You remember how he was hidden away after Athaliah had been the the wicked usurping queen that tried to overthrow the house of David. And yet Joash was hidden away and then he was anointed as king when he was only a lad. This is then written perhaps around 830 BC. So 3,850 years ago or so. The re- one of the reasons for saying this is because reading through the whole book, you'll find that the house of David or the king is never addressed. It's always addressed to the priests and to the people because, and to the elders because the king was not old enough to be able to, re- to receive such instruction. Just like us as well, all the things that they had been trusting in were shaken. Because it was a time when they had not had a lot of affliction in the way of um, devastation of their property or or sickness or, or those sorts of things. And so when this locust plague came upon them, surprisingly came upon them, then it exposed how they were not trusting in God. Our trust, there, there's uh, several things that we can see here in the text. First of all, it speaks of trust in the good life. Wine, entertainment, pleasure, that sort of thing. Look at Joel 1, 5 through 7, where they're told to wake up because they're deluded by all of their pleasures. They feel that things are right between them and God because they have so many things that they enjoy. And so God shakes these pleasures. Look at uh, one five, Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Now you see, God gives us many things to enjoy. They are gifts from his hand. The pleasures that we enjoy in this world, some of them are sinful. Drunkenness is certainly sinful. But enjoying wine in a responsible way is not itself sinful. And the things that the people were doing... Again, some of them were very sinful. Some of them, though, were pleasures that we're given by God to enjoy. And yet, God has stripped these away from them in a measure as he has from us in this time of our affliction. We cannot go out to gather with our friends in various places. It is a time of affliction. There are certain things that we enjoy, recreations that we do in places outside of our home that we're not able to enjoy. God gives us these but we need to know that they come from him and that he can remove them as quickly as he can give them. A second thing that we rely on in our carnal security is our trust in our protectors. Here in our text, you have the picture of the bride who is a virgin bride. She had not yet married her husband and yet she was betrothed to him and something happened so that her husband was taken away from her. 
We trust in our government to protect us. We look at our health care system and we rely on these things rather than on the Lord who gives us such things. Look at Joel 1, 8 through 10, and we're told to lament. We're called to lament. One, Joel 1, 8, lament like, like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. She was going to marry this man and he would take care of her and provide for her. And now she is to lament because he is no more. He is gone. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns for the grain is ruined and the new wine is dried up. The oil fades. God may care for us through these things, but they do not stand without him. Again, God can take away the things that we rely on. It goes on. Joel goes on to talk about how we trust in our work, in our food supply. Now, there are many people in our land that have been taken away from their work through this affliction that we have. Joel 1, 11 through 12 tells them to be ashamed. The locusts, of course, in their case, had devastated everything, all of their, um, the, the crops and things that they were growing. So Joel 1, 11, be ashamed, you farmers, wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. We have surely seen how fragile our economy and our food supply is. Many people are afraid and they're, they're gathering food and realizing that when their stores run out, that if God were to afflict our food supply, not that that has been extremely severe in this time, but if he were to do that, we would be devastated. We need to realize how fragile these things are. And then there is our trust in our priests and the means of grace, offerings. Of course, now we have ministers of the word and that sort of thing. And we have the means of grace where we have the Lord's Supper and such things that are now cut off in certain ways. Joel 1.13 says to lament. It says, gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. One of the things that God had appointed to them was to take a portion of their offerings, of their, of their uh, increase in their fields, and to offer those to God in thanksgiving as a means of grace, that they would come before God with these things in thanksgiving. They weren't able to do that because all their crops were ruined. And so the, the offering was cut off. So it has come about in God's providence for us that we're not able to go to the Lord's Supper. We're not able to assemble together and partake of that particular means of grace at this time. This has, this has been an affliction for us. Joel tells us what to do in response to these times, that we are to lament and fast. We're to see, of course, that God is the one who gives us the means of grace and who uses the means of grace, and that God who gives them can take them away or cause them to fail. So Joel says in response to this, we should lament and fast. The call to fast flows through the whole book. Look at Joel 1.14. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Now, there's a sense in which we can't gather into the place where we normally meet, but we gather in this manner that God has provided for us in gathering in the, uh, through, the, through the internet. But you see that the call is because of the affliction that God has sent to cry out to the Lord, to fast before him. And then Joel 2.12, it says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, 
and with mourning. So therefore, we in obedience to the Lord call a day of fasting this day. Fasting is one of the means of grace that God has given us. And interestingly, it is a means of grace that is sometimes used, it's used on special, at special times of affliction, and sometimes it acts as a substitute when we're not able to c- carry out the other means of grace. At this time where we can't use the means of grace of the Lord's Supper, then we can use the means of grace of fasting. And God is not bound or tied to the means of grace that he has appointed to us. God can visit us just as much when we use the means of fasting, when we're cut off from the Lord's table, as he can use the Lord's table itself. We always need to remember that he is the Lord of the means. And we need to make diligent use of the means of fasting at this time and crying out to him. Of course, prayer is a means of grace that can never be taken away from us. It can be caused to fail, but no one can keep you from prayer. By taking away the things in which we trust, God reminds us that he is Lord of all of these things. He gave them to us and he can take them away. We are not to trust in those things. We're to trust in him. These afflictions that we are experiencing in the current situation and that the people in Joel's day were experiencing are but a foretaste of the coming day of the Lord when he will strip away all of these things from the ungodly and bring blessing in all of its fatness and fullness to all of his people. there, There are summons to us to prepare for that coming day of the Lord. Joel introduces us to this term, the day of the Lord, in this book. It is the first time chronologically that it is used in Scripture. How much worse it will be, the day of the Lord, than this virus or the locust plague that his people experienced. It will involve devastation by fire at the hand of angels The Lord Jesus speaks of this often in his teaching that the angels will gather the wicked together and that things will be burned up at that time, including the wicked will be cast into the place of torment where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It falls upon those who do not repent. Look at Joel 1, 15 through 2, 11. It says, alas for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand. There's that phrase that becomes common in Scripture. The day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Now see, this is not talking about the locust plague. This is something that the locust plague is only a harbinger of. That the current uh, pandemic is only a harbinger of the day of the Lord. It says, Is not the food cut off from before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clods, storehouses are in shambles, barns are broken down, for the grain has withered, how the animals groan. The herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. O Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has devoured the open pastures. And a flame has burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the open pastures. Blow the trumpet in Zion. That's chapter 2 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is a day at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, And behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. 
Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots over mountain tops, they leap, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation, and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon grow dark and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? And we'll there end that reading from God's word. Real repentance is needed to prepare for the coming day of the Lord. The day of affliction that we are under now points us to prepare for that coming day. It teaches us to feel the authority and the lordship of the Lord, that he is indeed the Lord, that we might humble and afflict ourselves before him and that we might seek his grace that we be found in him. We must sincerely turn to the Lord our God as our gracious and only savior. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Don't trust in the fasting itself. Don't trust in the fact that you called a day of fasting to call on the day of the Lord and that you observe that. No, rend your heart and not just your garment, not just what you wear. Look at Joel 2, 12 and 13. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. You see, Joel calls us to this because of what we have received, the affliction we have received in view of the affliction that will come on the day of the Lord. Joel gives us five reasons that we should turn back to the Lord. First, because the Lord is so very gracious. He is a welcoming God. Any sinner that comes to him will not be turned away. That sinner will be welcomed. Look at what Joel says, 2.13, continuing verse 13. So I'll, I'll, I'll actually begin at the beginning of verse 13. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent? And leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. In other words, they'll be able to worship him again with with the fruits of their hands and the things that they have grown. How much more do we know this now with our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is a gracious, restoring God who welcomes sinners? The second reason that we call on him, because he will restore. Joel 2, 18 through 27 Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain, new wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beast of the field, for the open pastures are springing up and the trees, and the tree bears its fruit. 
The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. My great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Praise God for these words and for what they speak to, to us. For we know the fullness of God's everlasting blessing that we in Jesus Christ have been made heirs of glory, heirs of everlasting salvation, heirs of heaven. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ and God is going to restore a new heavens and a new earth that will be filled with the riches and fatness of the earth and the blessings that God gives to his people. And there will be no more shame, no more famine, no more sickness, no more devastating armies. God will bring this about for his people. That's why we should call upon him. We call upon him with hope. And then yet another reason is given by Joel, because he will pour out his spirit upon us when we cry out to him. Joel 2, 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into the darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Now this has, of course, been partially fulfilled for us in, the, in that the Holy Spirit has indeed been poured out and been given. And by that Holy Spirit, then we have received the word of God, the gospel, the prophecy that has been given fully to us now by the apostles and prophets that were given in the first century. The Lord Jesus has poured out his spirit so that now we have a full record of prophecy in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel of our salvation that testifies to us of God's mercy and to us in Jesus Christ. And that Holy Spirit is given to us as a seal of even greater things that are yet to come. The reason I said partially, we've been given the fullness of prophecy and the spirit has indeed been poured out on the church. But we do not yet have the fullness of the working of the Spirit that we will have on the day of the Lord, the last day when He returns and we're brought to perfection. And we have no more sin in us. The Spirit will, will fully sanctify us and glorify us and we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. The things that are revealed to us by the Spirit of God will be fulfilled in that day. That's why we cry out to the Lord. We, are, we, we have the, the gospel that, that is given to us and we have the hope of eternal completeness and fullness. And then another reason Joel gives is because he will deal with our enemies. Very, very important. That's the first promise that we have after the fall of man. Satan led us into that rebellion and God told the man, I will, I will bring about a new people that will be delivered from, from those people, the seed of the woman, and I will crush the head of the serpent. God will crush Satan 
and all who are in league with him. All of those who oppose the kingdom of God, who oppose our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the kingdom, who do not want people to be reconciled to God because they remain enemies of God who have not been delivered from that bondage. Listen to what it says. Joel 3, beginning in verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations. Now, why will God gather them? He says, I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as a payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon and all the coasts of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? Will they try to retaliate against the Lord? But if you retaliate against me, swiftly and speedily I will return your retaliation upon your own head. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my prized possessions, also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks, sold them as slaves, that you may remove them far from their borders. Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them and will return your retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah. And they will sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. God says, bring all your, your great warriors and everything before me. Get your weapons ready. Verse 10, beat your plowshares into swords. He's speaking to his enemies here. He's taunting them. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come all you nations and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be wakened. And come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Just a reference to you of the valley of Jehoshaphat. That was where God gave King Jehoshaphat great victory as he was one of God's people when he had a very small army against a great host that came against him. God is reminding them that though my people may be few, that with me behind them, they will have the victory. He says, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for the, their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. In other words, it's going to be a complete change of government. That's what that refers to, the star, that, the, the moon and stars and sun that rule the day and the night, that God will diminish those leaders that they have. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, then Jerusalem shall be holy and no aliens shall ever pass through her again. Now we know that God did this many times for his people in various ways. He delivered them from their enemies. But at that great coming day of the Lord, at the last day, then God will bring a final and utter judgment so that these words will be fulfilled that no alien shall ever pass through among the people of God again who would try to lead them away from God. Know that all oppressors of his kingdom will be delivered into the lake of fire and to the final judgment. How can they stand when they oppose the very kingdom of righteousness that God graciously came to restore and refuse to enter that kingdom, though the offer is extended to them? That's the fourth reason that Joel gives why we should cry out to the Lord. And then the fifth reason, which is one of the most important reasons of all, because the Lord our God in his mercy and grace will fully acquit us. Look at verse 18. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Acacias. In other words, there's going to be this provision for God's people, this rich and full provision of what they desperately need. It says, Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness because of the violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in the land. That's what happens to the enemies as we just saw. Verse 20, but Judah shall abide forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. How can they abide forever when they too are sinners? Verse 21, for I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, whom I had not acquitted, for the Lord dwells in Zion. God is with his people, and his people come to him, looking to him for forgiveness and salvation, and he provides for their acquittal, so that their sins can be pardoned, and they, though also sinners, can be forgiven of the Lord. Now we know what our Lord did to accomplish that, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. They had it only in shadows when Joel wrote these words. But we have the full revelation of God's provision for our acquittal, that he gave his only begotten son to be the Lamb of God who gave up himself on the cross. He was the priest. He was also the offering. And he was delivered over to be crucified in order that we might have the full remission of sins, full pardon. How could that not atone for our sin? Where sin abounded, grace abounded far, far more. Now that Jesus has come, we have reason and we have seen what God has done in sending Jesus. We therefore have reason for even deeper humiliation when we as the people of God have sinned against our God. And corporately, the people of God, the church, all of us individually and corporately, we have not measured up to what God has called us to be. And God has therefore sent this affliction upon our whole world. It's because of the church's sins primarily. We're the ones who intercede for for the nations and for the world. And God has brought this upon us all because of the sins of his people. We need to turn back to the Lord our God That's what we're called to do at this time. We have the standing testimony of what our sin did to our Lord Jesus Christ. That he who is the very son of God had to bear the pains of our sin, the very curse of God. It brought him under deep sorrow and repentance. We have sinned against that grace. Having seen what God did for Christ and still we sin. People in the Old Testament didn't have all that revelation that we have now. We have less excuse. We have more reason to fast and to humble ourselves in prayer. We have the fuller testimony of how complete God's restoration to us is and how complete it will be. What we saw before, that that he is so full of mercy and willing to save us that he even gave his son. There's five reasons that we were given. That we're joined heirs with Christ to share glory of him, with Him in heaven. That by His grace, we will be like Him. That already we're sealed with the Holy Spirit who has transformed us and changed our hearts and brought us in to walk with the Lord. And that that will be fully complete when we go to be with Him. That our enemies will be destroyed. Satan and all who are in league with Him will be cast out and that we will have full acquittal. Our Lord Jesus Christ at Gethsemane shows us what he had to bear in order to bring this about. As he was, as, as he was facing the cross, what was his posture? We read it earlier in uh, Hebrews 5, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Why did he need to be saved? He did not sin. He needed to be saved because of our sins. He had taken our sins upon him. 
and he had to be delivered. That's why he cried out as he did, as we see in Psalm 22. And Psalm 38 is a reflection of, of how he cried out. It says, though he was the son, though he was the very son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He continued to obey God and to do the calling that he had been given to go to the cross that meant terrible suffering for him, more than any of us will ever know. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. God has given us a wake-up call. He has severed us from the things that we rely on in carnal security in order that we might realize that we need to turn back to our God. Our lives are for Him. Our lives are to be depending on Him and looking to Him to deliver us. Cast away your sins, forsake your sins, and turn to the Lord. Bring yourself to Him and He will deliver you. You can't deliver yourself. Come to Him. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ who is offered on the cross. He has shaken the things up in which we trust so that we can turn back to Him. It is a wake-up call. COVID-19 is a wake-up call to the whole church of Jesus Christ. Repentance is needed. A return to our Savior is needed. Let's call upon the name of the Lord our God on this day. Let's make this day a day of crying out to God and afflicting ourselves before Him, humbling ourselves for our sins, and looking to Him as our only deliverer. Please stand and let's pray to him now in this assembly. And I urge you to pray uh, after you leave this assembly throughout this day. Let's call on the name of the Lord our God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, because we have sinned against you, Lord. We are a guilty people and we would confess our sins before you, Lord how sluggish we have been in our love toward you, how weak we have been in calling upon you. Lord, you're an open fountain for us, a fountain of life, a fountain of mercy, a fountain of deliverance. And how slender have been our calls for your assistance, for your provision. You have given your son and we have not relied on him as we should. Oh, Lord, turn our hearts back to you. Turn our hearts vigorously to you. Not slenderly to you. Vigorously to you, Lord, that we may come and that we may find the fatness of your bounty, the blessing of your grace. Oh, Lord, you fill vessels. You fill vessels and your, your filling never ceases. Only when the vessel ceases. Only when the vessel wants no more. Only when the vessel closes. Oh, Father, open our hearts to receive the bounty of your grace. Lord, we need your grace not only to bless us when we come to you, but we need your grace to cause us to come to you, to turn us back to you. Oh, Lord, turn our hearts back for you provide that grace too. You promised, Lord, that you would baptize us with your Holy Spirit. We would improve our baptisms. Lord, we would ask you to call upon you to visit us with that baptism mercy. Father, that cleansing that we need, that renewed heart, that stony heart to be taken away and that heart of flesh given to us, Lord, so that we call on the name of the Lord, so that we delight to do your will, so that we realize that our very life is to do your will, is to be brought into your care, and into your household, and into your hands, and into your Son, who is freely given to us. Oh Lord, have mercy upon us, Lord. Look at the way that we have relied on things for our security, not as things that you have given us, but relying on them as if they stood on their own. Father, how flimsy are those things. If you should blow upon them, then they are all gone. Lord, we rely on our pleasure and our entertainments to make our lives. We have relied on our government and our hospitals, things of that nature. We have relied, Lord, on our work 
and what we can do to provide for our families, on our economy, and the strength that we have as a nation that has been greatly prospered and blessed by your hand. Father, we cannot rely on these things. These are things that you have given us. Lord, we have relied even on the means of grace. We have puffed ourselves up that if we go through the ritual, then all is well with us. Oh, Lord, it is not. The rituals can be a stench to you. They can be an offense to you that you take away as you did many times in the history of your people. You have deprived them of the courts of the Lord. Father, we are somewhat deprived of them now. We pray, O Lord, that you would restore our assemblies again, that you would bring us back together to worship you, Lord, in the way that you appointed. We pray, though, Lord, that in this time of affliction, that you would use the means of grace that you've appointed, our fasting and our prayers, and also the assembly that you have enabled us to have in the way that we're having it now. Father, we thank you that you have been merciful to us and you've given us these things and we pray that we would make the most of them. We pray, Lord, that we wouldn't look at these as things that we can kind of lightly esteem or lightly make use of. Father, we need to cry out to you because... Our very life depends on your mercy and your answering us. It depends on our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you have provided in our attachment to him. Oh, Lord, if we be not joined to him, then we're miserable. We're cut off. We're lost. We're ruined. Father, we know that you will bring destruction upon all those who oppose you, who do not wish to follow you, who do not wish to come into your kingdom, who do not come to that which you have provided for us, who, who sniff at your provision. Who, who are angry at your provision, who look at your provision as foolish, who deny you, who say there is no need for any provision. Oh, Lord, these things are blasphemous. But we come to you, Lord, as children crying out to our Father. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us a heart to cry out, a spirit of prayer and supplication, and especially when we see what our sins did to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, wound us, wound us deeply in our spirit that we may delight in our Lord who was wounded for us, that we may rejoice in what he has borne for our sins. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would restore our land at this time of destruction. We pray, Lord, that you would be pleased to, to restore to us uh, the, the, our health, Lord, again, for you have taken that away from us, Lord, in this locust plague that we have experienced. So we pray, Lord, that you would, you would bring about the, the blessing to us, that you would restore the things that you have taken away, not so that we could trust in them again, but so that we could give thanks to you, Lord, and, and receive those things from your hand and not as if they stood on their own. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Oh, Lord, deliver us from our sin. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So receive now his blessing in this time of affliction, the blessing of him being a God who hears your prayers. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you from out of Zion. May he grant you according to your heart's desire. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.